Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to another uh, deeper lecture. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Andrew Winner. I'm an adjunct professor here at SICE Europe. Um, I'm all, I also, uh, and I teach the uh, strategy and policy course here. Um, I'm also a professor of strategic studies at the US Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, today, I am really, really pleased uh, to be able to welcome and introduce a colleague of mine, also from the Naval War College, uh, Dr. Emily Holland. Dr. Holland is an assistant professor in our Russia Maritime Studies Institute at the War College. Um, I'm pretty sure she's the most in-demand faculty member over the past, particularly a year and a half. We've been probably flying from the East Coast to Europe on a monthly basis um, at the invitation of governments, admirals, think tanks, universities. Um, and the reason is her research focuses on energy politics, Russia foreign policy, U.S.-Russia relations, nuclear geopolitics, populism, and European foreign policy. So you can see why she's in such demand. Um, Dr. Holland received her PhD in political science from Columbia University and was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Um, interestingly, along with uh, co-authors Josh Busby at UT Austin and Morgan Bazilian at Colorado School of Mines, she's a recipient of the 2023 Minerva Defense and Education Civilian Research uh, Grant. And this is a, a thing that links up um, professional military education institutions with other private universities for a long range study. And the study that they're investigating here is on critical minerals, battery technology, and reducing dependence on hostile supply chains, or hostile suppliers in clean energy supply chains. So as you can see, very you know topical for right now. Um, we'll have Dr. Holland speak for roughly 30 minutes, and then we'll have questions and answers and discussion. This will include folks who are online and viewing this. Um, you can type your questions into the Q&A box, and we'll read them out here when we get to that portion. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Holland. Emily, welcome to SICE Europe and to Bologna, and the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. I am thrilled to be here. Um, so just that was a great introduction. I'll just uh, add a, a few things. So when I first started uh, getting my PhD, I won't tell you what year, it was a while ago, um, I decided to study Russia, Russian foreign policy, uh, Russia as just a major world power. And let me tell you, I was absolutely um, encouraged not to do so <laughs> by many people, by advisors, by faculty. They said, nobody cares about Russia. It's a declining power. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, wait, I spent five years learning Russian and going every summer during my school holidays to live in like small towns in Russia. And you're telling me I can't do a PhD on this. Well, thank God I didn't listen. Uh, because as you know, Russia remains an important global power and, um, you know, their role as an energy superpower, of course, as the instigator of a terrible war on continental Europe, all of these things make it a really important place to study. So my, my word to students is study what you want, right? <laughs> Don't listen to people, um, you know, study what you're interested in. And I, hopefully nothing so bad like Europe um, annexing Crimea. Well, Russia annexing Crimea will happen, but you know, you never know. So I started studying energy politics and particularly Russia around 2010 uh, because I was really interested in Europe's uh, energy strategy and their foreign policy, which was basically set up in the 1960s, and we'll talk about this soon, of just creating enormous dependence on Russian commodities. And that, as you'll see is in the talk, was actually sort of the pillar of European economic growth, right, was this premise that they would get cheap commodities to fuel industrial production and then sell those goods to China. And that's been sort of like the pillar of the European economy for, for the past, you know, 30, 40 years. And so all of that has basically changed since 2022. So it's really sort of hard to underestimate the impact of just how important energy is to a lot of a variety of global impact, of, of global outcomes. Okay. So, uh, we'll start big. 
sort of the global age, uh, the golden age of globalization was really premised on, you know, interdependent supply chains, right, that could source raw materials and intermediate parts from all over the world um, to produce the pieces at the lowest possible cost. But the COVID crisis, first of all, um, and then the increased geostrategic tension as a result of that, we kind of laid bare some of the weaknesses of this approach, right? So you started to see during COVID things taking a long time to come because there was some you know, let's say some factory couldn't get the, the metals it needed to make some screw and that then uh, caused supply chain disruptions down the line. So very quickly after, as you know, in February 2022, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as well as its kind of long term strategy of using hydrocarbons as a coercive tool of statecraft, kind of rendered in very harsh relief the vulnerabilities of the approach associated with tight-knit economies and globalization, right? Particularly between adversaries and competitors. And because of the really unprecedented scope of energy globalization, what we're seeing today is that even quote unquote energy independent states like the United States are not insulated from global shocks to the market. And these shocks can come from anything, right? It can come from Russia invading Ukraine. It can come from a drought, right? It can come from a ship being stuck in the canal. Right? Any of these things can happen and they can have huge impacts on a variety of economies, even ones that you might not expect. So returning more to the energy side, the severe disruptions to the market caused by Russia's war in Ukraine have really exposed the vulnerabilities of the security of supply of raw materials, and that includes hydrocarbons, for industrial production and for the green transition. And so this is when we're going to be talking a little bit more later about critical minerals, right? So, so it's not just that you can say, okay, I'm going to stop buying Russian hydrocarbons and everything's going to be great. Well, how are you going to replace that? In the EU's case, that's by accelerating the green transition. Fantastic. How do you power the green transition? Well, you need stuff to do that, right? Critical minerals, metals, a whole bunch of things that still come from the ground, right? So we're going to talk about sort of how we're shifting some of these dependencies. So this graph here is a great one. This just shows um, actually uh, uh, where Russia is exporting its hydrocarbons to. So you can see that, you know, despite the fact that actually uh, sales to Europe, that's the, that's the blue, has declined precipitously since the war, they are actually still selling a lot of hydrocarbons. They've just replaced who they're selling to, right? So now Russia sells mainly to China and India and to other states, uh, and less to the EU. Okay. So Russia's the 11th largest economy in the world. It can change depending on how you're measuring it, right? But, you know, it goes from like 8 to 11, depending on how you decide to measure uh, the size of the economy. And it's one of the world's biggest oil exporters and producers. It's the number one exporter of gas in the world. Does anybody know who the number one producer of gas in the world is? No. The United States, that's right. This is all because of the shale revolution, right? So so that's when I, when I say that the US is energy independent, that's what the US likes to say, right? Because we are producing enough gas generally for our demands, but that's just a fallacy in today's society. No country is energy independent, right? Because markets are so highly linked. Um, so Russia is a huge importer, uh, exporter of oil and gas. They are also a huge exporter of coal, uranium, rare earth metals, minerals, agriculture, everything, right? So even though we can say, let's cut Russia off from the world economy, let's import, let's, let's, let's place sanctions on them, let's isolate them. That is just, an impossibility. It is impossible to cut Russia out from the global uh, the global markets because they are a market maker in basically all of the things that we need and the, of the raw materials. And so the sanctions uh, that were in, put in place by both the U.S. and by the European Union in May 20, uh, 2022, um, you know, completely changed sort of the global patterns of trade. So you can see here, this is just the, the Russian imports of gas. And you can see in 2023, they're at minimal levels compared to their max levels uh, in the in the 2010s. Um, and the sanctions regime was basically supported by uh, something you may have heard of. The European Commission published what's called Repower EU, right? You guys know about this. If you've ever been to Brussels in the past two years, you'll see giant signs saying Repower EU all over central Brussels, right? And this was the European Commission's plan to gain full independence of Russian fossil fuels by 2027. 
completely independent of Russian fossil fuels by 2027. This was amazing. Because let me tell you, as somebody that was around Brussels and Europe from the early 2010s, everybody knew that dependence on Russian fossil fuels was a problem. But there was literally nothing that could change the strategy in Brussels, right? So they knew this was a problem, but they could never get it together to sort of stop this problem because every state has its own interests, right? And some states just didn't want to make any changes. So the fact that the EU was able to put together this very ambitious plan in a really short amount of time is amazing. However, if you take a real deep look at that plan, you'll see that I'm sorry to use this expression as the kids say, the math is not mathing, right? It's called magic math, okay? So if you look at actually how they plan to replace those volumes of Russian hydrocarbons, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's basically impossible in years where there is average energy use or higher energy use, so say if there was a cold spell, to replace those volumes just with what's in the market in the world right now without causing significant price spikes and that would disproportionately affect poorer states in the world, right? So why hasn't there been an energy crisis since 2022? Anybody know? Everybody was like, oh my God, there's gonna be an energy crisis, Europe will freeze, it's terrible. Why hasn't that happened? Yeah, it's been really warm, right? It's been incredibly warm. Last year was very mild winter. It's looking like this year could be pretty mild winter. Have you been outside? It's, it's pr pretty warm for November, right? Um, so if it stays warm, it might be okay. Does that seem like an energy security strategy to you? <laughs> right, strategy is about preparing for hard eventualities, right? Not praying that global warming will keep the world warmer, right? So, so Europe is in a little bit of a tricky situation in that regard. And we'll talk a little bit later about what that, what that means for um, uh, security and dependence. Okay, so how did this happen, right? And this is sort of really serious implications for today. So this is a lovely picture. I'm sure many of you will recognize many of the characters around this, this, this uh, turning on of the gas pipeline. This is at the inauguration of Nord Stream 1. Okay, so we have Angela Merkel there, we have Medvedev, we have Alexei Miller in the background, we have Francois Fillon, we have all the major players. But the origins of this dependence actually start many, many years ago. So back in the Cold War, when pipelines were built to export Soviet gas to European consumers. And this was actually set up by the Europeans, right? Not by the Russians. And actually, particularly by one company, uh, it's an Austrian company called OMV. And still today, if you look at maps of gas, pipe, gas pipelines throughout Europe, you'll see that the, a huge hub of gas pipelines is in, is in Austria, right? So they come to Austria and then kind of like go out in different branches. And that's because OMV basically helped to set up this, this pipeline. And for years, they made tons of money off this. And by the way, OMV is still importing Russian gas. Do you know where they sell it to? Because Europeans don't want to buy Russian gas. So OMV is importing Russian gas. Where does the Russian gas then go? Anybody know? Ukraine. Ukraine does not buy any Russian gas since 2014. But what they do do is Russia sells it to the Europeans and then the Europeans sell it back to Ukraine. So that is how Ukraine gets its gas. It's Russian gas, it's just bought through Austria and redistributed, okay? So this will tell you a little bit about the complexities about the, po the politics around this because it's not possible for Ukraine to get the gas it needs, not from Russia. Where is it going to get it? It doesn't have LNG terminals. Where is it going to set that up? On the Black Sea? That's not exactly a great place to be getting energy right now. You can't just build new pipelines, right? That takes tons, that takes 20, 30 years, takes hundreds of millions of dollars of capital. So those, th those fixed infrastructure pipelines are still there. It's just that that's the only way they can get their gas. So that's a little interesting. <laughs> so, um, you know, this was originally set up, it was great for the Soviets because they could get hard currency for their commodity sales. And it was great for the Europeans because they could get relatively cheap natural gas. And the West Germans thought that, hey, this is a great way for us to normalize relations with Moscow, right? And this actually became, off politic, the defining like point of German foreign policy until literally two days before Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th, 2022. So does anybody know what happened on February 22nd, 2022, that ended basically off politic? related to this picture. 
the Germans canceled the certification of Nord Stream 2. Remember Nord Stream 2? That was the second tranche of pipeline that the Russians and the Germans had built for years to build a pipeline directly be bringing Russian gas from Russia to Germany, right? And basically what that did was it cut out Ukraine as a transit state. So Ukraine, Poland, all the Eastern European states for years had been lobbying in Brussels saying, do not approve this pipeline. This is dangerous. This is causing dependence. And it'll, really, it'll basically get rid of a critical deterrent of Russian aggression. Germans did not want to do this. The Swiss didn't want to do this. Nord Stream is basically owned by a consortium of European companies. And so they did not want to cancel this project. And so Germany, as the sort of you know cultivator of Ostpolitik, held really fast onto this until just two days before. Russia invaded Ukraine. So for years, Eastern European states had argued that dependence on Russian gas was a major, major security risk. But Western Europe in particular, and particularly Germany, they did not want to believe this because it would have upset the apple cart, which was basically the structure of the European economy and in particularly the, the German economy. So the pillars were, one, cheap access to Russian energy so that European industry could be competitive. Because without access to subsidized energy, can European industry be competitive? Cost too much. Why does it cost so much here? Labor costs. Yeah. Living, you have to pay a living wage, right? And so without access to subsidized energy, European industry is not competitive. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that means actually for the future of the European economy. And it's not great. And the second pillar of that is growing exports to China. Well, okay. So as of February, 2022 and after now, number one is gone, right? That cheap Russian energy that's gone. And number two, growing exports to China is actually also currently under threat, right? Because that's at risk because of why? Because of what I was talking about at the beginning, about countries sort of decoupling, like worrying about risk, worrying about hostile suppliers, right? Um, having more strategic autonomy. So it'll be very interesting to sort of see how this energy pillar affects the European economy going forward. Okay, so this all, by the way, didn't happen because of Russia's war in Ukraine. These things were happening before. Uh, in, in 2021, I don't know if you guys remember, there was actually an enormous energy crisis, right? Um, that in fall, uh, basically inventories had fallen to less than 40% of capacity for the gas pipelines. Um, US, Europe had a serious gas pr crunch. There were sky high prices. Industry shut down. And the industry that they began to shut down in fall 2021 actually basically remained shut down after the war and then afterwards. And these are some of the industries that are like really highly energy intensives, like, for example, fertilizer production. And they stopped producing because it became very, very expensive for them to get the raw materials needed, like ammonia. And actually, European fertilizer production is still basically but not back online. The German fertilizer production, which is one of the, the biggest producers of fertilizer, they're still not producing because it costs too much. It's just not profitable for them to produce fertilizer anymore. Now, this obviously has secondary effects, right? If there's less fertilizer in the world, what does that mean to food prices? They go up, right? And then what else caused problems with food prices? The war in Ukraine, right? So now Ukraine, Europe's breadbasket, is only trickling out little amounts of grain. Uh, Russia is, you know, not exporting as much, right? So these are these these are these really cause these huge kind of ripple effects in the global economy. Okay. So, can Europe quit Russian energy? Can it do it? Has it done it? What do you think? It has. But by what replacing? Okay. Partially, yes. Partially, yes. Europe is still buying Russian gas, right? There have been exemptions for certain countries who basically refused to go along with the EU's demand to reduce energy. But then also in a sneaky little way, uh, Europe is buying more liquefied natural gas, right? Because it's not buying Russian pipeline gas. So it's buying liquefied natural gas from places like Azerbaijan, from places like Algeria, from Qatar, from all sorts of places. But do you know who else sells liquefied natural gas? Russia and the U.S., right? Both. So this is great for the U.S. Because the U.S. now is able to sell a lot more liquefied natural gas to Europe at pretty high prices. Yes. 
Yes, it is. Norway is. And that's 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 a combination of pipeline and liquefied natural gas. But the U.S. is like a huge proportion. It's like 35%. So that's actually an enormous amount. And why is Europe such an attractive market for places that want to sell liquefied natural gas? Well, you pay a lot for it, right? You're rich. You pay for it, right? So if all this liquefied natural gas is coming here now, post-2022, what does that mean for the rest of the world? It's not like there's more liquefied natural gas now than there was two years ago. There's a little bit more, but not that much. It means that other places is not getting it. So one of the sort of big consequences that hasn't really been talked about as a result of the energy crisis is the fact that, uh, well, now Europe is scrambling to basically buy up every last drop of liquefied natural gas. So places that previously bought it are priced out, right? So this has caused actually a huge crisis in the global south because countries like Bangladesh, um, countries in Southeast Asia, they can no longer afford things like liquefied natural gas or kerosene that they used to. And this actually caused like a huge number of crisis, which we really didn't discuss a lot in, in the Western press. Like for example, um, in Bangladesh, uh, some of the fisheries industries actually collapsed entirely because farm uh, fishermen were no longer afford, able to afford kerosene for refrigeration. They couldn't refrigerate their catches. And so the fisheries industries got wiped out and it's kind of just slowly coming back now, right? And this happened in a bunch of places and it's still happening. Because we just, the reality of global energy right now, sadly, is that there is not enough to feed all this demand if you take away Russian gas, if you take away Russian commodities. So Russian commodities are now going to other places. But now, since Europe is trying to buy on the market, there is just not enough to go around. And actually, a quite disturbing statistic just came out a few days ago that actually global demand for hydrocarbons over the next 50 years is set to increase, not decrease. And that's because the reality is, as much as we would like to transition to net zero as soon as possible, we do not have the stuff necessary to do so in the time frame we want it, both in terms of critical raw materials, but also the infrastructure to do that. Because infrastructure takes a really long time to build, right? Okay, so what are the consequences of this? Yes, now you can buy your liquefied natural gas, but it's more expensive. So the consequences of this for Europe are really interesting. Well, prices are at historic highs, but also demand has to decrease. And that has happened in Europe, right? Because places that use a lot of energy can no longer afford the amounts of energy that they once had. So states that are, are countries that have a lot of uh, industries that are very ener energy intensive, those factories are producing less. Um, so yeah, just a few days ago, the statistic came out that Germany's industrial production is down 17% since the 2010s and that's about lost about 100 billion in output that's significant because actually if you're looking at the european economy one of the first indicators that you always look at is german industrial production that's one of the drivers of the european economy and just yesterday uh draghi i think you know him he warned about a uh basically no question recession for the european economy at the end of this year so the eu has fallen behind the us and the gap is growing very very rapidly so in 2008, the EU and U.S. economies were about the same size. Uh, last year, the U.S. economy is 25 trillion, and the European economy with the U.K. is less than 20 trillion. So without the U.K., the European economy is now 50% smaller than the U.S., and that's in a decade. That's a very worrying trend, especially if you think about how the European economy is set to grow and the sort of development plans for the European economy basically based on green energy uh, and transitioning away from carbon intensive industry. And that's a very, very long, difficult, challenging shift. So again, how are we gonna replace all this Russian energy? Well, we'll see. Okay. So another question that I get that I wanna talk about is sanctions. Have sanctions worked on Russia? Okay, here's my, here's my question. What are sanctions supposed to do? What is the aim of sanctions? Let's talk about it in the this, in this, in this specific Russia case. Okay, economically cripple a country, that's one. Incentive, yeah, 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 that's another. What's another reason for sanctions? Yeah. Potentially regime change. And what's the mechanism of that? How would that work? 
Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So there's many different logics behind sanctions, right? And nobody's actually agreed on like what, what which one is, but they're sort of all correct, right? So, okay. So has this punished, so have sanctions against Russia punished Russian people? Are they hurting? I'd say so. I would say so. Um, has it hurt them enough to demand regime change? No. Okay. So no. So that hasn't worked. Has it shamed and admonished the Russian state to say, we don't like what you're doing? In Ukraine? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's we 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 pointed our finger at them. We're shaming them. I don't know if they really have gotten that message. Sure. Um has it hurt the economy? Yeah, it has. Structurally, it has hurt the economy. Has it been able to cripple Russia's war chest? The war chest meaning the money they need to fight the war in Ukraine. Basically not, actually. And one of the reasons is because of some of the issues that have been triggered by the war in Ukraine and the global energy crisis. So you can look here just at the different in uh, oil revenues between 2021 and 2022. So up 71% in oil. And this is because of basically demand. 260% in gas revenues and 170%. So and that's in 2022. And then this is the latest thing, um, oil and gas reg revenue in 2023, just in September, is its second highest revenue on record after April 2022. So yeah, they're still getting tons of money for their energy, uh, certainly enough to keep waging this war for a considerable amount of time. No need to, to stop that. They will probably make some some cuts in other areas like, I don't know, you know, social services, but it does not seem to affect their ability uh, to spend on defense. And we actually look a lot at how they distribute their budgets and most of their defense spending, particularly on uh, certain fleets, like say in the East and the Pacific have been completely insulated from any sort of budget tightening. What we really see is issues of supply chain and munitions. Um, but actually, if you look at what happened over the past few months, Russia's more or less solved those munitions problems. They've indigenized a lot of production and they're getting a lot of stuff from North Korea and Iran. So they've actually solved their munitions problem in a way that the West has not been able to. So that'll be, have great, great outcomes for the war in Ukraine, I'm sure. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. I wanna talk a little bit about, okay, what can we do to improve energy security in Europe? Well, the answer will surprise no one. Europe has to transition faster to renewable energy. But this is really, really hard in the short and medium terms because renewable energy requires metals, which are also in a price crisis because Russia is a market maker in critical minerals and metals, and also because of export controls. Um, in the short term, this has required a return to coal. We are seeing that all over Europe. Countries are burning more coal in 2022 and 2023 than they were in the previous decade. And that's just the reality because people don't really want to make sacrifices when it comes to energy. Energy austerity is a basically a dirty word. Politicians don't want to touch it, uh, even though relatively small changes could make huge differences and impact. So there was some stuff, you know, last year about people wearing sweaters, right? Like um, uh, the French were saying, wear turtlenecks in your office, you can keep your thermostat down. But actually, like those things seem silly, but they actually do add up. Right? There are lots of things that you can do to reduce consumption that would have actually made a huge difference. But politically, people don't want to go through with that. Okay. Um, another thing that's really important is uh, the relationship with the United States. And this relates to the IRA. Do you guys know what the IRA is? Yeah. So it's designed, it's an it's American piece of legislation that was designed to reduce reliance on Chinese supplier while also incentivizing a shift in green energy manufacturing back to the United States. It's a really profound, but actually seriously trade distortive subsidy um, that actually unbeknownst, or maybe they didn't think about this, who does it harm? The EU, right? Because it makes country, it makes companies want to actually go produce in the US because it gives them such serious subsidies. So it's basically drawing green energy production technology to the US and taking it away from Europe. And this caused actually quite a bit of problems, right? So since its passage, a number of companies announced uh, plans to create new clean energy manufacturing in the U.S., including major EU battery companies, uh, 
NL, Fryer, also Volkswagen, BMW, they all decided to move to the US. And this actually made Europe quite upset, as you can imagine, right? So the, the first reaction was that Europe decided to attempt to protect its competitive, basically by focusing on sort of broader aims um, and speedy de decarbonization and EU development aims and focusing on sort of EU subsidies to then attract those, those companies back. And the problem is that this really hits a really sensitive area for the EU, and this is all part of the sort of energy and, and economic development picture, is that how can Europe reimagine its industrial policy, a changing workforce, and major structural economic issues resulting from the collapse of the EU energy Russia trade, right? So the challenge for the EU is how can we keep EU manufacturing home? Because as we've seen in 2008, when manufacturing jobs leave a place, they tend not to come back, right? So in 2008, Europe lost a lot of manufacturing jobs. They went to places like the Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia, and those jobs never came back. So for now, Europe is worried. We say, how do we keep these jobs here without losing them to say now the US or something like that? There's been a sort of lot of discussions about this and hammering out changes. Um, and the EU EC uh, proposed the European Green Industrial Plan in February 2022 that would sort of provide a lot of money for um, green transitioning, permitting processes, higher borrowing limits and things like that. And the EU hopes that these measures will work to prevent firms from shifting manufacturing to places like the US and China and will accelerate Europe's goal of becoming climate neutral by 2050. So, one thing that I would recommend to both, and I do this to U.S. audiences as well, is that actually the sort of competitiveness between the EU and the U.S. is exactly what we should avoid, right? It's the complete opposite of what we want to happen for both the U.S. and the EU economy, right? It's really imperative that both the EU and the U.S. increase ally shoring, right? So work together to keep jobs between the two to help bolster resilience against potentially hostile states, Um and, and the EU is, is working with the U.S. to try to help them, to help the U.S. sort of work together. Because now that we've sort of gotten rid of Russia as a hostile supplier, well, we have to worry about where are we getting our stuff from the clean energy transition. As you all know, this is not news to you. China largely controls the mining, refining, processing of all rare earth minerals. So the key to repower EU is how do we get these things from a potentially hostile supplier, right? And this is the exact same thing that we sort of worried about with Russia, right? The idea that like, okay, if something goes awry with the relationship between the EU and China, China could decide to say, no, we're not gonna sell you whatever uh, graphite or copper or whatever. And that would be a problem because in the EU and the US, there's basically very, very little uh, capacity for production and refining of these rare earth minerals. So in some critical minerals, China has 100% of the production and processing chain. In a lot of the rare earth minerals, they have like up to 90%. So we have very little control over the refining and processing of these plants. One of the reasons is these are kind of dirty businesses, right? So metallic production, minerals production, they're very pollutive. So we have in the in the US and particularly in Europe, there are pretty stringent regulations on environmental right on reg regulations. So companies can't couldn't even build a pro like a refining or processing plant if they wanted to. So these are very difficult trade-offs, right? You think for clean energy, we have to roll back like say clean air initiatives, but these are some of the difficult sort of conversations that policymakers are having right now. A secondary problem is we just don't have enough physical stuff to power the green energy transition. So for example, copper, uh, by 2031, we would need 50% more copper than we currently have available on the market to meet these transition goals. Do you think that's doable? There's enough copper in the world, it's out there. Why can't we get it to the market? Well, on average, it takes about 10 to 12 years to build a mine and operate a mine. That's on the that's the that's the the positive side. <laughs> In many times, it can take twenty to thirty years. Mining is a really long, slow business. I'll tell you the story. Uh, there is a mine uh, in Serbia, the Yadar lithium mine. It's one of the biggest lithium mines in the world. And Rio Tinto owns it. Rio Tinto is an Australian mining company. They've poured billions into this mine. Basically, the mine's ready to go. It's not open. Why? Anybody know why? environmental protests. Serbians don't want this mine, this lithium producing mine in their backyard. 
they're like, it's going to poison our water. It's going to poison this. It's going to poison that. And so they don't want this mine. Okay, fine. So then where are you going to get the lithium? Lithium's all over the world. Latin America, sure. And why is it faster to open a mine in Latin America than it is in Europe? Figure regulations, exactly. So these are some of the questions that, that the EU is having to deal with right now. And just to kind of add some, some more color, just two days ago, the Chinese Ministry of Commerce uh, basically increased export controls on rare earth metals, oxide products, and crude oil. And they set these in motion until 2025. They had export controls on gallium, germanium, and graphite, which are now all very, very carefully managed, the export of. Um, you might not know these minerals and metals. I'm sure you know graphite, but uh, gallium and germanium, anybody know what these things are for? Yeah. They're magnets, yeah. And what are they, what are they used for? What kind, of, what kind of things? Wind turbines? Also weapon systems, right? We're very, very important in lots of high-tech weapon systems. So we don't have any of this stuff. They're only basically coming from China. And so if China puts export controls on them, that just limits the amount of stuff that we are able to build. And this you know, comes about from a sort of long-standing trade war with the US. Okay, last thing, and then we'll, we'll go to questions. So this basically has led to basically a new gold rush in the Arctic, right? Which is where a lot of these critical minerals are. Um, and as you can see, who is one of the biggest Arctic states? Russia, right? And Russia has really sent, put like the Arctic as one of the main centers of their development strategies. So that's where they're investing tons of money in infrastructure, uh, both for hydrocarbons, for metals extracting. Uh, it's the centerpiece of the Northern Sea Route, which they're pinning their hopes on, right? So they are just putting tons and tons of, of time and energy and like and focus on the Arctic. Uh, and uh, we're quite behind on that because they have many icebreakers. We have basically, well, when I say we, let's talk about, let's say EU, Canada, and US, we have like a handful, a handful of them. Russia has about 60 or 70, right? But it's not easy. So getting things built and out of the Arctic is not easy. It requires a lot of infrastructure. It requires safety. It requires technology, hard capital, all these things that Russia does not have right now because of sanctions. Um, so where are they getting money to explore and option these things? China. Yes. So China is a major partnership in a lot of big projects like the Yamal giant LNG project. Uh, China is seeking to be called what's a near Arctic state, right? China is not an Arctic state, but they want to be regarded as a near Arctic state. And they think that Russia is basically their way in to the Arctic. And for right now, there's quite a lot of cooperation between Russia and China and the Arctic. And you know, if you think about Russia as a economic power, you cannot divorce it from military power. Because what Russia does in the Arctic is it's basically the centerpiece of all its economic planning is based on military. It's based on the Northern fleet. So that's, that's Russia's Northern Navy. They are there basically investing in platforms and safety and infrastructure and all these things to basically facilitate Russia's ability to extract metals and minerals from the Arctic. So this is going to be sort of a new area to look for as we are transitioning now from I hate to say a post hydrocarbon world because that's very far away, but as a, a new focus on green energy, this is going to be one of the, the main areas to look on. And I will stop there for questions, I think. Yeah, sure. Good, fine. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's great. Appreciate it. All right. Um, so, the floor is open for questions both here in um, in Bologna and also online, if folks want to type in questions and answers. Um, if you have a question, please, um, if you could uh, share your name and where you're from, or if it's uh, if you're coming from in from outside, your where you're from or institutional affiliation. Um, so with that, we'll open it up for some questions. Hi, my name is Christy. I'm part of the MIPP program. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on the role of um, I don't want to present Africa as a monolith, but your um, view of the future of Africa's role in terms of meeting some of these energy demands, um, aside from just saying global south. 
Yeah. I mean, so obviously, again, I don't want to treat Africa as a monolith, but certain countries in Africa, like I think, of course, the DRC is one of the world's you know, largest suppliers of cobalt and gallium and other really important critical minerals. And they have a huge role in this. Now, um, how do I put this delicately? Uh, for many years, the U.S. and other uh, Western states were not that interested in pursuing relationships, even commercial relationships with countries in Africa, but China was. So they have set up institutionally these linkages, these mining companies, these export chains to basically extract as much as they can and bring them over to China for processing. So it's only now, really in the last few years, that sort of alarm bells have gone off in the West to say, oh, wait, maybe we should have done a little bit more economic statecraft in these places where China was doing this for years. So, so yeah, there's a huge role to be played, but uh, the West is really starting off on the back foot uh, because, you know, when China approaches these countries with economic projects, they don't have a lot of strings attached, whereas most of sort of either Western aid or development projects come with a lot of strings attached. And so it's very attractive for uh, governments that maybe are not so transparent to uh, go with the projects that don't have a lot of requirements, say, for transparency or for responsible mining or for you know, no child labor, anything like that. So there is a huge role, but it's going to require a lot of investment. And I think I, I, I've been disappointed with um, uh, the West's economic statecraft because they haven't really been sort of willing to do the investments necessary to make fruitful and long changes and impact. Um, and I think that's because a lot of these investments require sort of actually generational investments, right? And particularly in the US where we have these like four year term limits and very volatile politics, you don't see politicians wanting to make those sort of long term investments in these places. Hi, thank you for being here. I'm Alessandra. I'm in the European Public Policy Program, and I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, do you think the CBAM would make it harder for the European Union countries to import these carbon intensive goods that are necessary for the transition? And then uh, talking about the NGL investments in, in, in Siberia, is that like a consequence of the issues that uh, Russia had with the construction of the pipeline with Japan and China? And then they opted to to invest in NGL to not have to build like a preferential route for one or the other partner. Yeah, those are great questions. I mean, so here's the thing about the EU. What I think it's Brussels is notoriously hard to get things done in, right? Everybody knows this. But if you look at what they were able to achieve in the face of Russia's invasion of of, of Ukraine, you can see that actually anything can be done really really quickly if you put your mind to it, right? Um, I think that in terms of, you know, Europe is in a, Europe's in a challenging situation right now. And I think that what's happened is there's been a tendency to try to pretend that this situation is not happening. So we see states just wanting to subsidize and protect consumers from high costs when actually that's the wrong thing to do. You should actually make consumers feel this pain so that they stop using as much energy, right? It's a sort of backwards incentive project. So yes, I think CBAM is going to make it harder to import these goods that are necessary, but maybe that's a good thing if European governments decide to stop subsidizing so much for the consumers. It might be painful in the short term, but in order to get to net zero, there's going to have to be some pain felt by consumers. It's just the reality of this sort of transition. Consumers need to get used to using less energy, <laughs> and they're not going to do that if they are not paying the market costs of these things. Yeah, uh, you, absolutely. You're right. It's very it's very unpopular politically. I I wrote a piece for One on the Rocks a couple of years ago about energy austerity, and I wrote about Jimmy Carter's famous speech about energy austerity, in which basically like broke his career, <laughs> right? Um, but actually, the message was correct. It's just politically unpopular. Now, the political consequences for Europe are, are really actually important because, you know, what, if you think about it this way, decline in industrial production, higher energy costs dictated from Brussels. What, like, what, whose dream is this? This is like 
the far right's dream. They're salivating over this, right? Like blame Brussels for a loss of, of, of industrial jobs and since consumers having to pay more high prices. Like this is what the far right is like living for. It, they've been qu relatively quiet because it was so politically unpopular to be associated with Putin for quite a while. But, you know, like there obviously is a resurgence of the far right. We had AFD sort of break out of the wall in Germany and we're going to probably see more of this, you know, moving forward. And so who knows? You know, who knows what the what the politicians will decide? I don't I don't I don't know. Um, but, you know, Europe is in for for a reckoning sort of regardless of the political affiliation of who's in power. Um Regarding Siberia, yeah. So Russia, in terms of the Arctic, is basically throwing everything at the wall and hoping to see one thing that will stick right now. They don't have the capital or the technology needed to basically do all of the things that they had planned in their Arctic strategy um, because they've been cut off for Western technology basically since 2014. And so they're forced to work with the Chinese, but they are very, very skeptical of working with the Chinese, both because they're concerned about tech transfer uh, in some cases, I mean, they, they know that there's tech transfer happening and they don't trust the Chinese. So I've had many conversations actually with people in the Russian energy industry who say very bluntly to me that they would absolutely prefer to work with Western majors than with the Chinese because they don't understand the Chinese. The Chinese drive very, very hard bargains. They're pretty inscrutable to the Russians when it comes to the sort of dealings that they have, but they don't have any choice right now so they are locked into this now in a very interesting i i don't know i don't really don't know what to say about this but i was um in reykjavik a few weeks ago at the arctic circle assembly and there was a um a chinese phd student who got up and presented on sort of energy issues and he said there was a slide i took a picture of it i have not seen this in any other news sources only he said it that china is basically pretty unhappy with some of its investments in russia particularly yamal they said it's not as fruitful as they would like it to be and that there may be structural adjustments happening from China in terms of their investments. I don't know. This seemed pretty provocative to me. I was surprised by this, but it'll be something to watch out for. And I think it's important to know that as we're you know, really concerned about the deepening relationship between China and Russia, to know that there are pretty significant areas of disagreement between Moscow and Beijing uh, and that you know these circumstances have forced them together, but I think that these are areas that will continue to be a problem between them for quite some time. Hi, thanks for coming. I'm Gabe. Uh, I'm from the U.S. Uh, I was really interested in your mentioning of these knock-on effects on industries in the global south uh, from reduced energy supply. But you also mentioned that Russian energy output or, or revenue increased. So didn't they make up that gap? And like, how did that work? Uh, and the second is when you talked about like searching for critical minerals from, for example, developing countries like Latin America, uh, to what extent do you think the relationships will be colonialist in the sense of like extraction of raw materials there? And then like you mentioned, this like domestic pressure to increase jobs in the US and Europe. The, the, the parts of the, the higher parts of the value chain being there um and like yeah how, how are you thinking about that thanks okay great question so in in terms of the knock-on effects in the global south right so yes russia has made basically been selling more gas but to or gas and oil to india and china but not necessarily to poorer countries right um it, it's really the 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 very poor countries that have had the most difficulty in this so sri lanka basically is living in in blackouts i don't know like eight hours a day blackouts because they just don't have uh, pakistan has blackouts right so there's there's all these poor smaller countries that are basically not able to make the big deals that russia that i'm um, sorry that india and china make with russia because they can make you know deals for huge amounts of volumes and then you know get a discount or whatever but these smaller countries cannot do it and so they're the ones that really suffer for this. And, and and still today, I believe Pakistan is having eight hour blackouts every day because they can't afford their electricity. Um, and Pakistan is not a warm country in, in the winter. It gets really cold, right? So these are serious sort of knock on effects from that. And that's probably going to remain this way for the next couple of years, just because the market is so tight. And the reason the why, one of the reasons why the market is so tight, and this is kind of a perverse reason, is that for years there was very, very serious underinvestment 
in oil and gas. So persistent underinvestment in oil and gas because everybody was like, well, we're going to have this clean energy transition. Why are we going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in, in capital needed to increase extractions of hydrocarbons when nobody's going to be buying our hydrocarbons? Now, um, with record uh, basically sales for the last few years to our lovely oil and gas majors, they have realized that they can still make a pretty hefty profit. And so they are now sort of making these investments necessary because they know and they see that actually for at least the next 50 years, we're going to have pretty significant hydrocarbons demand. So, so they were kind of making up for it. But again, these things take a really long time, right? Like it takes like about four or five years for investments made in the sector to actually increase output on the global market. So that's why we're in this spot of, of real tightness for now. In terms of, um, you know, sourcing raw materials from places like the global South and will it be colonialist? I, that's an interesting question. I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, a lot of it depends on the nature of the relationship with the regime, right? So if you're having, if you're getting it from Bolivia, well, it depends on the nature of the regime, right? Um, one of the things that the U.S. is really focused on, and so is Europe actually, is indigenous production of mineral metals, metals and minerals, right? So that's why the U.S. is so heavily focused on Alaska right now. It's like, Alaska, Alaska, Alaska. And, you know, basically like if you're um, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks right now, like, boy, are you busy? Because there's just, you know, tons of, of demand uh, for, for that. Um, the problem with that is that, well, there's not a lot of people in Alaska. So if you want to have this like booming metals industry in Alaska, well, you have no human capital to do so. So that's a problem. And how are you going to attract people to go live in Alaska? That's actually a huge challenge for them right now. Um, and then it's about money and permitting and production. So here in Europe, um, it's not so much about mining. Well, there is mining, but it's about um, production. So how can Europe basically reduce the bureaucratic burden of allowing the permitting process for production or refining. And that's challenging because, yeah, it would be great to have a production or refining capacity for whatever minerals here in Europe, but then like, who actually wants to have it? What country is going to host that, <laughs> right? People don't actually want that because it is dirty. Smelting is a dirty business, right? So that's why in the past, states have looked towards third party states to do this. But as I was mentioning in the beginning of the presentation, there's this real mood right now in Washington in particular for strategic autonomy, right? For doing everything onshore, everything onshore, right? And I think depending on how the 2024 US elections go, um, that might be an even bigger in uh, a sort of mood in Washington. And that's not just in Washington, it's in Europe too. So in terms of colonialism, I don't know. I mean, we're seeing sort of just a lot of internal uh, demand for for um, indigenization for all of these things. Front here, back. Okay, Oscar, you, and then just one other thing, just um, we I, I see the online question. So that's after Oscar. So just so the person knows. Okay. Thank you. I'm uh, Eileen Güney from, uh, I'm an associate fellow at SAIS uh, Europe from Turkey, um, a professor of European integration. I just, um, uh, your presentation was very thought provoking, but I just think that you haven't mentioned two um, important regions that could provide, especially natural gas to, to Europe. One of them is Eastern Mediterranean. And the second one is Central Asia, mm -hmm. you know, excluding Russia, uh, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, you know, that region. And of course, that brings into the picture the, the role of Turkey, too. So I would like to have you an assessment of how is it feasible or is it not feasible to have access to these um, sources in those two regions and via Turkey? Thank you very much. Great question. I just I excluded it only for time, but I think I'm actually personally very fascinated. This spent a, spent a couple of weeks in Turkey in the spring, actually doing some doing some research on this because Turkey is actually such a crucial component of of the EU's energy strategy. So there's Turkstream pipeline, uh, there's the Blue Stream pipeline. Um, uh, for many years, Russia was really interested in Turkey because. Um, the only uh, area in Europe that was basically projected to have increased gas demand was Southern Europe, right? And so Southern Europe was actually not very well connected to the rest of Europe via the grid. So 
uh, Russia decided to build a pipeline through Turkey that would then come up through Southern Europe, through Bulgaria, into the Balkans, and be able to pri- provide natural gas that way. And that is that is up and up and running all of those plans. And also because Russia and Turkey have a very interesting relationship, right? It's very transactional. Russia is right now building Turkey's first uh, nuclear power plant at Akuyu. It's their first civilian nuclear power plant, and. I was over there doing some doing some nosing around and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. But one of the most interesting things, I think, is that because Turkey is a non-nuclear state, they don't have nuclear experience, they didn't have any um, nuclear safety legislation. So they just asked Russia to write it for them. So Russia wrote Turkey's nuclear safety legislation and Turkey's parliament just passed it. So so that's an interesting choice. But yeah, so Turkey remains a critical component for getting gas, not only from Russia, but as you say, from Central Asia, right? They're a, a really important com- uh, commodities component for, for European plans. And Turkey, I think, is um, being very smart right now because they are taking advantage of the fact that they have, you know, a working relationship with the EU and with Russia. When I was in Istanbul uh, in the spring, there were basically more Russians speak being spoken than English. I mean, just tons of Russian business happening. Um, you know, many Russians were investing there. There's a lot of sort of black market trade going on through Turkey and the EU. And, you know, Turkey is sort of playing its cards very close to its chest and being very strategic about the fact that it is sort of an intermediary between between Russia and the EU and will continue to play a, a serious role in um, providing non-Russian commodities through Central Asia, right, to the European Union. Um, and because of the tightness of the market, you know, Turkey remains pretty critical to the EU plan. So if, so, you know, who knows what will happen, but if there was some sort of, you know, political disagreement between the EU and Russia and between the EU and Turkey, it'd be very difficult to proceed without Turkey in terms of getting um, some of the natural gas, particularly to Southern Europe, which is not well connected to the rest of the continent. So it's a really important player. Oh yeah, in Eastern Med. Well, uh, yeah, so who, this is all up in the air right right now, as you know, but you know, uh, the landmark gas deal that came about last year was actually huge. There, the, there's huge fields um, in the Eastern Med that are actually relatively easy to get to, but now with the conflict, this is all sort of unraveling, and it was sort of difficult to get these agreements to begin with with all of these countries. It was a, a, unbelievably a sort of miracle, and to my mind, a real piece of evidence for the importance of materialism, right, to show how much material incentives can overcome these serious ideological differences. But now it's it's really all up in the air. I don't I don't know what will happen with these projects um, as long as there is you know war in the region. In the, in the back, and then Oscar, and then our online question, and then we'll go from there. Hi, I'm David. I'm a first year MAIR, also from the Accent American. Um, I think in foreign policy courses in the US, uh, we've often discussed the sort of future ramifications of Russian expansion in the Arctic, as well as sort of Chinese cooperation with that expansion. And I think we've been hearing for years that Western allies need to do something to combat that expansion. So what have Western allies been doing to combat that expansion? Have they been investing in the infrastructure necessary to sort of bring that sphere of influence back into the West? Or are things sort of doom and gloom when it comes to making that a supply chain for hydrocarbons? Yeah, um, well, a few things. One is, have we been investing in the infrastructure? The answer, short answer is no. (laughs) <laughs> we haven't really in the Arctic. Um, the Arctic actually is a really interesting era. If you're studying it from like an IR perspective, the the Arctic was amazing for many years in how cooperative it was, right? In, in, in the success of multilateralism. Like there were so many multilateral forums in the Arctic that were wildly successful. And you got places like Russia and uh, Greenland and uh, Denmark, all these making actually like really amazing inroads and respecting multilateral um, organizations in the Arctic until 2022. Okay, so in 2022, the Arctic Council basically said they're not going to work with Russia anymore. And so now all the Arctic littoral states besides Russia are working on all these initiatives, right, like fisheries, environment, all these things. Well, uh, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's pretty hard to get anything done in the Arctic without Russia, 
So if you're excluding Russia from these forums, you're not really going to get much done, unfortunately. And I, I think actually there are a few areas in the Arctic, which may be one of the few areas for potential cooperation with the West. Like Russia has an interest in Arctic fisheries. And so does all the other Arctic countries. Like maybe this is one area in which there could be some sort of cooperation. And if you think back to like the worst parts of the Cold War, when countries were not even speaking at all, there was always some level of scientific and technical cooperation happening, even in the Cold War. And that's not even happening now. Like that's not happening now. And maybe this is one area in which that that could happen because, you know, scientific exchanges are really important, right? You get scientists being able to communicate with each other sort of beyond politics. I don't even know if that's possible domestically right now in Russia. Like, I think it might be so toxic for a Russian researcher to be working with an American one. I don't know. But, um, you know, there is potential in the Arctic, I think, for more cooperation. Right now, there's nothing. But, you know, there is maybe potential one day to get back to that area of deep cooperation. But in terms of is the West investing in the Arctic? No, not to the same extent as Russia by a long shot. There is like um, some pressure, and particularly from the Coast Guards, um, saying that they need more resources, but they're I don't know. I don't know if that's happening, if anybody's going to give them anything, um, uh, because all of the sort of commercial projects that are envisioned in the Arctic basically need Coast Guard participation uh, for safety and rescue and all those things. But for right now, we haven't really been investing so much in that, although that might change as we're shifting more towards um, Alaska. Thank you, I'm Oscar, I'm Italian half American, I'm a Maya student, but also you from the University of Bologna. And I remember that last year in uh, my course in the University of Bologna, we actually did a lecture on uh, on the European, e the EU's dependency on Russian gas. And a thing that I remember really well of that lecture was how uh, there's a big discussion between the EU within the EU on how basically on to find basically the uh, the uh, how to reduce this dependency and especially finding the the th those partners in the world that could uh well I was like looking at mostly at like the uh, where to get the LNG gas mm -hmm. uh, especially within the EU there's a discussion between especially like Italy and the southern countries that rely more more on like Azerbaijan and um, especially North Africa. Very recently, uh, Italy is building a strong partnership with like Algeria. Yeah. And while instead the northern countries like Germany and the Netherlands, they have other plans on getting LNG from elsewhere. So I wanted to ask you, well, how do you see, uh, do you see that there's going to be, uh, that the EU will actually overcome these differences and find uh, a good alternative uh, partners or if there will still be these splits? That's a great question. And I think the, the problem now in the EU is the same problem that plagued it for many years before is that Brussels can dictate this like strategy, but ultimately every country is sort of out for themselves. Right. And, and that's been problems for years. And basically this, the Russians recognize this and they had this divide and conquer strategy for Europe, which was very, very profitable for them. Right. They would give favorable prices to good consumers and punish others with higher prices. And unfortunately today, Europe is not, countries have resisted like a central buying plan. They've resisted um, opaque, I mean, transparent contracts. They've sort of resisted all of these things when actually like the, you know, the biggest thing that the EU has in terms of offering is a single market. But countries are very resistant to that, right? For a variety of reasons, political and otherwise. So um, in energy, it's a little bit trickier because, you know, despite the fact that we have LNG, LNG still requires infrastructure, right? So it's it's faster to build an LNG import terminal than it, you know, to, it is to build a pipeline. Sure, absolutely. But then you still have to get that LNG from the port to what's called at burner tip. So like when you turn on your 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 tap your taps for your um for your stove. And how does it get there? through fixed infrastructure, <laughs> through pipelines, right? So, and in many cases, which was very interesting, was for years, actually, Gazprom actually bought up that infrastructure in European states. Like, Gazprom would own the pipeline that went from, let's say, the entry point in Moldova to a consumer's house. They owned that. <laughs> um, the third energy package made that illegal, 
right? So it was an unbundling package. It sort of sought to break up the monopoly. But many states sort of derogated that for years and are just now rebuying their own infrastructure because of differences politically. And so now that the EU has said, okay, no more buying Russian gas, fine. Well, they still have to compete with each other <laughs> to get this stuff. And that's another difficulty because it's we're, you're not buying from a single platform. And so, you know, my advice, if I was anybody who's listened to me, would be uh, the, the EU work harder to purchase things together because, you know, purchasing power together, you get a better discount instead of fighting for sort of all of these different, um, all these different suppliers. Of course, geography makes that quite difficult. As you said, you know, like it's much easier for Italy to buy from Algeria than it is for Denmark to buy from Algeria. So that's a difficult, but they're good. Exactly. 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 That's that's an, that's another complication. I mean, the problem is also like with North Africa, like, yes, you can make these and they have made these deals. But unfortunately, like the problem with a lot of the, the Middle Eastern energy, I'm sorry, the North African energy is that there has been political risk instability uh there has been a lack of investment because of the political risk and instability and so you had these sort of grand dreams in north africa to be like these major exporters and those things have just sort of not really ever come to fruition because of those those problems and i don't know what will happen with what's currently going on in the middle east now but there are there are rumors and and worries um about security of supply for north africa for sure thanks um, let me uh, read a question from online. This is um, from Dan Helmechi. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name in the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, and Dan, it says, thank you for your time and expertise. And can the U.S. and European allies use existing transition cooperation frameworks? And here he talks about the minerals security partnership, critical minerals agreements to develop Greenland's mining and processing potential. That's for one question. And then second, how could China respond given its interest in Greenland as a foothold in the Arctic? Yeah, Greenland, right? The huge place with tons of opportunity, right? Um, so the thing with Greenland, and this is not a, a value judgment in any, in any way, but um, in all of these places, particularly in the Arctic, there are major concerns about indigenous rights, right? So in making sure that the indigenous people have a buy-in and a say in what happens. Um, and this is much trickier than you might think, right? So uh, there are a lot of disagreements amongst different indigenous communities about how they want their sort of land to be used if they think this is a, an appropriate usage of this land, right? So some indigenous communities are pro this because they know it would be some sort of big cash cow. Others are very concerned that this would dramatically change their way of life and would basically kill off the way of life of these small indigenous communities. So it's a politically quite sensitive topic. And then, you know, that that's in general, but then particularly now, right? indigenous rights is like you know one of the biggest things politically it's very difficult so you get then politicians not wanting to touch the issue because it's sort of dangerous let's say to advocate for you know increasing mining in greenland when there's some differences and difficulties in terms of what what the indigenous communities themselves are looking for so i don't have the solution to that i, I don't know what to say about it but it is an option and i think you know, if I'm putting on a cynical hat and having studied energy for a long time, I'm quite cynical about this. You know, usually the money wins um, and materialism tends to win at, win at the end of the day. So, yeah, I would probably imagine that there will be some extraction and, pr and production and refining in Greenland, you know, over the next several decades. So the second part was, and what would China do and respond if, if indeed, you know, in response, if indeed, you know, you saw this increased investment for, on the part of Europe and, and the U.S.? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, you, I see China, you know, watching all of this, obviously, very closely. Um, it's actually one of the things that I've noticed I'm doing this, this Minerva grant is that when you really drill down into the national security implications of critical mineral supply chains, there is shockingly a huge divide, right? Some people say critical mineral supply chains are just as dangerous as hydrocarbon supply chains and that this is a huge national security issue this tends to be what like people in washington think they think that like okay we can treat minerals just the same as hydrocarbons and if a hostile supplier has access to this and this is dangerous we need to indigenize 
On the other hand, you have a bunch of scholars who are saying, actually, minerals are very, very different from hydrocarbons because the production and the refining chain is so long, because you need less of these materials, because they're, they're much more spread out in different places, that actually a place, a state like China might be less able to um, disrupt global markets in the way that they were if that was hydrocarbon. So like, for example, um, they, I think a few years ago, China decided to stop I'm forgetting what mineral it was. They put some export control on something to Japan. And Japan basically turned around and within two years was able to solve this problem, right? So it's much quicker. So in in that sense, like there's a little bit of a disagreement on like what are actual the national security implications of, of these mineral supply chains. So China's watching this and they, you know, I don't know what they would do, but I, they, they are aware now that the environment that they're working in now is not the environment that they're working in 10 years ago. So you, you know, people have, states have witnessed sort of what happens sometimes when you do deals with China. So you look at what happened with the Guaidar port, right? Um, states are now a little bit more savvy about this. And so they're somewhat a little bit less willing to sign on to these, you know, incredibly advantageous looking deals with China. So there's a lot more skepticism about that. Particularly in Europe, there was a really interesting um, Ipsos poll not too long ago. Um, it was one done, one done in Serbia, but then like one that was like a general European poll, and it was asking people what percentage, like who who they thought were the biggest foreign investors in their country, and most people said China as one of the largest investors, and that is not true because you know who the largest investor in most individual European countries is. The European Union, <laughs> like by by far, right? But but people have this perception of China as like being this huge investor, and that's actually not good. That's not good for China, right? So they're having to be a little bit more strategic now in terms of where where they're investing and what they get from that. It's the same thing years ago with the U.S., where everyone thought China had all of the U.S.'s T bills, yeah, right. And the two biggest investors were the U.K. and Netherlands by far, <laughs> um, and, but there was a fear, right? There was this concern that this was a, somehow a strategic lever on the part of on the yeah. part of China. Yeah, all right, other questions folks here, thank you. And then there's two back here. I'm Amelia, I'm from Minnesota. Uh, my question is the US has seen significant protests recently around the Willow Project in Alaska. Mm -hmm. How do you see Washington balancing domestic discontent with the desire or need to pivot towards Alaska in mineral extraction? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one that's, you know, currently being grappled with right now. Um, because, you know, there there is the potential to stop these projects. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I will say like mining has come a long way. And I'm not an advocate for the mining industry here. Okay. We like when you say mining, you know, you have these like really like I think like 19th century visions of like people coming up out of the coal mines, you know, covered in soot and, you know, dying of whatever black lung or whatever. And that's not really how mining is anymore. It's much more high tech um, and it is much cleaner and it is much safer, but it's got a really, really bad PR. Nobody likes mining. I don't know who's doing their PR, but they need to hire somebody else because they're it's it's not working for them. Right. And it has really come a long way in terms of much, much more responsible and cleaner, cleaner mining. Um, there are problems attracting to the workforce though. And that's one of the biggest thing I talked about human capital. So not only just for like the actual engineers and workers, which there are not enough of, we don't produce enough of them. And in the U S in particular, we don't produce any production and refining engineers. Like they just don't exist at all. So that's a problem. But then also just the larger community. Like when you set up a mine um, in a place, you need tons of different supporting initiatives you need obviously like the services to support the miners you need the bureaucracy you need enough people to go through the permitting stuff so you need like government workers you need all of these different people and so that actually can be a huge boon to a place like you can completely like one mine could completely revitalize let's say some alaskan town so it's it's a sort of a little bit of pr exercise i would say that is um maybe now they're thinking about that in a better sense but for a while I really don't think they're doing a very good job of that um, because it is a lot cleaner now. Um, not that it's perfectly clean. And I think this is one of the sort of biggest fallacies of the green energy transition is that the green energy transition is green. It's not green, unfortunately. Like as long as we're still using our iPhones and all this power stuff, like 
there's there's a consequence to that. And so I think if we're being realistic about it, you know, you can you can sell to the people. Hey, look, like if you grow on power, like it's gonna come from somewhere. But in the end, you know, this might contribute to less greenhouse gases or whatever, then you can maybe sell it to a community better. Hey, John. Uh, my name is Matt I'm from the US first uh, master's at IR student. Um, you mentioned that Ukraine is sort of indirectly buying Russian gas still to this day. Obviously, they're a little preoccupied at the moment, but do they have any sort of plans to wean themselves off that and buy gas from somewhere else? And are there other examples of people, or not people, countries buying uh, indirectly Russian gas like Ukraine is? Sure. Well, okay. First part of the question is, yes, Ukraine um, has plans, green plans. Um, unfortunately, Ukraine really started off in a very bad position because they had uh, natural gas reserves in Galicia, but the Soviets drained those first <laughs> to sell that to the Europeans in the 1960s. So they basically took all of uh, Ukraine's resources and sold them off early. So they, they don't have anything. And then secondly, the sort of second strike that Ukraine had against them was they had a very, very heavy industry um, development strategy. So they were basically like the, the industrial production for a lot of the Soviet Union, right, was built in Ukraine. And that's extremely energy intensive. And, and actually, a lot of these businesses were in eastern Ukraine, right, in Donbass or Donetsk, where, where the current fighting is. So they both had a no energy and a lot of businesses that used a lot of energy. So that was like a, a strike to begin with. They also had this gas transit regime. So they were the, the transit company that sold basically gas on, and that was really rife for corruption opportunities. So the gas industry in Ukraine was very, very uh, corrupt for many years. Moving that aside, so now they're at war. They are not using that much energy because there's no industrial production happening in Ukraine right now because there is war, right? So eventually, if Ukraine wants to revitalize its economy and become back to a functioning economy, they're going to have to solve the energy problem. They're... Um, strategy right now is to move away from heavy, heavy industry altogether and become a knowledge economy. That's what every country wants to do. Ukraine has a really, you know, kind of, or did have quite a, a, a booming IT sector before. And there are, you know, certain aspects coming back now, but, you know, as, as there's no surprise here, the reconstruction efforts in Ukraine are going to be absolutely massive and generational. Um, on the energy side, 65% of their uh, electricity grid has been damaged by the Russians. Um, there's still a sustained campaign against Ukraine's energy infrastructure. And the Russians are smart about it. They're actually going after stuff that's like really kind of hard to fix. They're going after interconnectors. They're going after these sort of small things that the Ukrainians are good at patching up. But like when you have this sustained infrastructure campaign for a long time, things really do get damaged. And I would not be surprised if the Russians really try to hit that again this winter um, ahead of the winter. So we'll see where that ends up. So Basically, Ukraine's going to have to completely transform both their development strategy and their their energy industry and infrastructure. And that's going to be very, very costly and expensive. Um, but the EU is probably going to foot a lot of this bill. Um, and so that might work in their, their favor. Um, but it's going to be a really long road ahead. Okay. And the second part of the question, are other countries still buying Russian gas? Yes. You know who is buying Russian gas? Anybody know? Shouldn't surprise you. Uh, they're not actually just a little bit of LNG, but yeah, Turkey, Austria, Hungary, Slovakia, Bulgaria, all still buying Russian gas and oil. So a lot of countries got derogation or um, exemptions. Japan. Yeah. Japan, Japan does as well, by the way. And Japan's an investor in Russian LNG. So, you know, people don't like to say it, but there are still, you know, lots of investment and lots of Russian energy flowing. And if we're being realistic, it's going to keep coming that way just because there's there's not enough, right? Like with, if you take Russia away, there's just not enough. And so countries are still going to be, be buying Russian energy for the, for the foreseeable future, for sure. Hi, uh, I'm Sam. I'm also from the U.S., uh, I'm just another mining question. Do you think there's a future in deep sea mining? Because there are considerable environmental risks, but it does address some of the other problems that 
you know, are associated with investing in other countries and so on. Yeah, great question. So deep sea mining is this like, it's obviously been this like long standing dream, right? For decades that, oh, there's these amazing minerals on the seabed and we can get them nodules, right? Um, but it's never really come to fruition. So just this past year, Nauru actually put in an application um, that would basically trigger, I guess it's, I forget the acronym of this like international something it's some international organization which was like basically tasked with making the safety rules yeah yeah making the safety rules for seabed mining and like for years they just like never published them because they didn't want to but now Ru put in an application in two years and it said if you don't approve this within two years then you have to make these these applicate the uh the publish these rules and like allow us to do this so that happened that happened this summer so now Nauru is actually allowed with companies to go ahead and do deep sea mining without any regulations being published. Okay, so that's actually legal for them to do so. And there are many different startups that are out there um, and was sweeping up the nodules and, and, and making this work. They're like the, the main one is they basically just put like a giant vacuum hose and they suck up these nodules and then bring them onto boats. But the nodules themselves are actually pretty small. Um, so we haven't yet gone to a place where like the commercial applicability is enough to satisfy global demand or even like to be very profitable commercial, like we're just not there yet. And then of course, like the environmental implications of this are not known and probably horrific, um, if we're, if we're being honest. So, um, depending on what, like right now, I don't think there's a future in the near term for this to be commercially profitable. But, you know, who knows what will happen? I mean, energy markets are transforming so fast. It, it could be possible. But for right now, the focus is on, um, you know, basically near offshore or, or onshore development. Great. Other questions? Coming near the end. Anyone else? Hadn't had their chance? Okay, no. Yeah, great questions. First about multinationals. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Rio Tinto basically sells everything to China. And the reason that they do this is because China owns the re the production and refining capacity because nobody else can do this and nobody else has done this uh, because they have the labor to do this and they have the facilities and China was strategic about this. So now the West is sort of trying to up production and refining capacity. So it is possible that Rio Tinto could sell some of that 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 copper to to Western allies. And now ally shoring is like, you know, the, the, the buzzword of the moment, and maybe this will happen, but you know, Rio Tinto sells on long-term contracts to China, right? I mean, and there's a reason that long-term contracts exist, right? Long-term contracts exist to protect the seller and the buyer, right? So the buyer wants to make sure that they can have access to this material for a long time. 
but also the seller needs it because they want the capital to make sure that their very significant investment in extraction is paid off, right? So that's why long-term contracts exist. So breaking those takes time and you know, increasing production capacity will take time. So right now, Rio Tinto is locked in to selling most of those goods to China because that's how China produces and refines them. They can't just like dump copper on the market and then uh, magically it's in our whatever, our, our home heating or something like that. So, you know, changing the infrastructure is what's really going to be crucial in the next few years and convincing multinationals to do that, you know, especially, you know, when they are responsible to their shareholders means making it profitable for them to do so. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges that the West has in competing with both Russia and China is that in Russia and China, the firms are not responsible to shareholders, right? So for example, Rosatom can go and build a facility in Turkey and pay for the entire thing on financing terms that just do not make any sense. Like if you factor in the cost of electricity, like Akuyu will never be paid back. Just doesn't make any sense. So no Western company is going to do that. Why would a Western company do that? But Russia doesn't worry about that. China doesn't worry about that. So the challenge for the West is how do we, with our companies that need to make a profit, how can we compete? against these firms that don't worry about that. And I think that's one of the sort of biggest challenges we have coming up. Oil price cap. Now the oil price cap was very controversial when it was instigated among sort of energy people. Many people were like, this is a terrible idea. Do not do this. And um, yes, it is true. We have given our basic strategic rival, China, a massive discount. And it hasn't really worked for Russia either. Sorry, like they've, they've, they've sold their stuff at a discount, but you just saw they've had their biggest record profit in the past year. They're making more money than ever because people are just buying more stuff. There's less of it. So I think the price gap has been an abject failure because it's hurt the West and it's um, benefited our rivals. All right. I think we're at, at our time. Um, join me in thanking Dr. Holland for presentation and questions. Really appreciate you making the trip and uh, thank you everybody for our uh, Staying engaged and some terrific questions. Appreciate it.